happens, stalemate, the trenches, they couldn't get, you know, break it, they tried to widen the war, they still couldn't break it. So this is a question every government's having, especially after the Somme and Verdun. There's also going to be a massive Russian offensive called the Brusilov offensive that basically failed. How do you break a stalemate if you can't win a big victory in the battlefield? And this is something every single war has. They're all hoping for the one big victory. Remember, Albert Bayer Mahan even talked about the one big victory. And it never happens. How do you win a war? So, tactical means instantaneous reactions. Let's say on a battlefield, the enemy moves left, I react. I hit their flank. That's tactical. Long-term is strategic. So, they need long-term goals to win this war because they can't win it on the battlefield. How do you knock out the enemy? I found this map and I thought it was great. It's a map in Russian, so I figured why not? If you're looking at oh, something seems wrong, that's Austria in Russian. So really, it's really interesting. Like any language. But how do you break a stalemate? Well, remember William Tecumseh Sherman. What was that where he tried to show the South how terrible the war is going to be for the people? If they keep fighting, what was that called when he went from Atlanta to Savannah? Do you remember that? What was that called? That's the march to the sea. I called it total war, even though the term would be dubbed in World War I. Total war. The chief of staff of the commanding general of the German army in 1917 is the one who coined the term. The general, we'll get to him later, is Paul Hindenburg, but the chief of staff is Eric Ludendorff. Ludendorff right here, considered the brains behind the German offensive. He was wrong so many times. Uh, yeah, questionable. But Ludendorff, we must make this total war. And that's, he coined the term. We must take the war to the enemies and break their will in front. If we break the enemy's will, they'll give up. The problem is, we can't win on the battlefield. Part of Verdun was to break the world by killing so many of them, but they're still fighting. Attrition is really that, how long they can stay in the fight. This is a French city destroyed by German, retreating Germans. Leave nothing but room. But how do you break their will? Now, if technology changes, this would become even more deadly for people at home. But so much of the way wars are gonna be fought to this day will be decided here. Now, other countries are doing it. Remember, the Allies are blockading Germans and starving them out, starving civilians. But we didn't have a name for it. I chose this very creepy picture for a reason. War, Ludendorff understood, as anybody who's serious about war understood, then it's not about tactical decisions on the battlefield. It's, it's political will. How long can your country accept horrible losses and sacrifices to stay in the fight to win or lose? Oh, sure, you might lose a battle, might lose decisive battles. Russia lost many decisive battles. Tandenberg and Tarno and Gorlis are the two biggest I told you about class, but they stayed in the fight. They made a political decision. War is politics. You must change the political will of the people. And therefore, take the will to them. But it's more broad than that. Remember mobilization? Mobilization meant they mobilized the entire economy. You know, they called the troops from the battlefield and took over the train, or the coup. they called the troops from the factories and took over the train system. That means the government's going to take over the factories. And government's going to have to take over the economy. If you're at war, you don't want businesses producing clothing for civilians or cars. You want car companies producing carriages for artillery, making tanks. Farmers producing food for war, not strawberries for people to have as a dessert. That's inefficient. You know, wheat products you use at the front. That means civilians are going to have to make a sacrifice, but the economy will be geared towards war. And if the economy is geared and war is a matter of politics, that means the economy is the target. If they can no longer produce, I don't have a picture of them, produce shells, you'll win. If they can't produce tanks, you win. So it's a matter of knocking out their economy and driving their political or destroying their political will. And that's why we have a new front, the home front. And that means the home front in total war becomes a legitimate target. And that means civilians. 
They adopted total war immediately in World War II. There was no, like, well, we're civilized. We won't do that. No. World War II, they jump right in. So these are British school children being taught. They all had to carry around 24 hours a day. The thought was, you have to be taught to get ready for a German gas attack. They were going to drop mustard gas on us, and we have to be ready. So kids would be taught this. If you live in Israel, for example, you all get, get, we, we'd all be German gas attacks. And um, as it turned out, gas was such an ineffective weapon um, as a whole, they didn't use it really in World War II that much, but they're prepared for that. And now they're targets. Hey, if you want to knock out the factory, it might be hard to actually hit it and go to the factory, but if you kill the workers, it's a factory. People become legitimate targets of this. Civilians make them suffer. Their children make them suffer. And if it's civilized, eh. To go to the 20th century, Europeans thought Western civilization was so civilized. Now, I should add, they were brutally mistreating colonies. So this was a lot of a lie here. But anyways, we're civilized. We're republics. You can imagine how that's going to be shipped to Europe for a civilized. What is civilized? Well, we want to tax civilians. Uh, we won't knock out their freshwater facilities. Eh, won't won't walk out, knock out their heating facilities. Eh, won't starve them to death. Got to win the war. If we don't act uncivilized, our uncivilized enemies will crush us. It's amazing how quickly countries adopt this thing. And think about it. You know, Russia lost in the Ukraine. Their main goal is they did not get it. But they stayed fighting for various reasons. And you, one, you'll see it'll be really clear why they're saying it. But what's their target now? They're attacking civilians. They're attacking power facilities, heating facilities, water facilities, getting out in sewage facilities. And that's where people, people live nearby them, so they're killing civilians. Why? To make them suffer so much to break their will. So, what are the goals? The strategic goals must be a twofold thing. First off, destroy their industry. If you can't make shells, you can't fight. And that means knock out transportation. If you can't get the food and fuel and everything else to the front or the raw materials in the factories, they can't win the war. And that means go after the fuel. Oil. Oil was important in the beginning of the war. It was incredibly important by the end of the war. And for those of you who know about World War II, it was all about oil. Japan attacked the Pearl Harbor for oil. And wars are fought to this day about that. The United States attacked Iraq in 2003, partially because of oil. And part of the reason Russia attacked Ukraine is because Russia is a poor country. Their entire economy is based upon the selling of oil and other resources. And if you're only based on natural resources, you have this never any desire to get more land with resources. And that's what Ukraine has. It's oil. You knock out their oil, they can't fight. But it might be hard to hit the factories. Difficult. They might hide them. But if you knock them out, you win. And so, Total war is, and do, I didn't write this down, it's attrition on the grand scale. It's attrition on the grand scale. You make them suffer so much they quit. World War I is really important for lots of reasons. If we're ever, ever changed the world to give us so much of our modern world, we're still living in its shadows. Total war might be the most important thing. And the other strategic goal is terror, to terrify the population. If you want to break their will, you terrify them. And part of this is the randomness of death. It takes morale, not just at home, but at the front. Soldiers don't like their families suffering. And I give you two examples right here of this randomness. So when the Germans started bombing civilians from the air, they're using Zeppelins, they couldn't hit anything, they bombed at night. So they just would drop small bombs over residential areas, just hoping to hit. Oh, you might have many blocks with no houses hit, 
but one. Why this house? They weren't aiming for it. It was just random. Here are the owners. We don't know who else, if anybody died or wounded. Just so random. And that randomness where it could be anybody, just regular people going to work and doing their jobs and having families, whatever it might be, it could be killed. That makes it even more scary than, let's say, a total saturation bombing in some ways. Because it's just so, it's so coincidental. One of the things that made the September 11, 2001 attack so terrifying were the people who died in that attack, just random people. Four planes were used as bombs, just happened to be on that one. The people who died in the Twin Towers, they just happened to be there early for work. And most who died in the Twin Towers, just they just happened to be above where the planes hit. Just the randomness, randomness of it makes it so scary. The same thing with starvation. Here is because of the starvation blockade, and these are Berliners lined up for a little bit of food. People starving to them by the nature of their jobs, where they live. Urban people starved at a much greater rate than rural folks. It was just this randomness. And people who are uh, bound, have malnutrition, they're more susceptible to disease. So that's much more random. And so what terrorism is, is state, or what total war is, is state sponsored terrorism. You can't win the war with normal political methods. So you find a different political method. You destroy the political system of their country. You make people believe their government can't protect them, and therefore they overthrow the government. You might get a different change of government. Remember, in 1864, all the South had to do to win was to get Lincoln out of office. Let's say you change the government, even have a revolution in your enemy's country. Did you just steal revolution in the country in that video? And so this state-sponsored terrorism, that's total war. What Russia is doing is terrorism. Ukraine is very terrified to do this, especially because their people giving them weapons don't want them to attack Russia. But it's the same deal. How, much, how many thousands of Russians can be killed before Russia has enough of the government? And they just, Russia just suffered a horrific defeat three weeks ago. Possibly. Over 10,000 men and 130 things. That's like, if you know anything about war, that's an awesome defeat. They keep fighting. We just had a revolution. And this really shows this, this terror. So, with that, oh, one more, I almost forgot. If you're doing it to a country, though, trying to get this, what's what are they doing? Remember, they're trying to do the same thing, and you know they're trying to do it. The number one tool then is propaganda. Remember propaganda, you know, that you have biased information, this is government, but they want that point of view. But this is going to be, therefore, a justification for all of this. And the number one thing propaganda is going to do is encourage nationalism. Love your country because of your country. Get people to think that we must all be unified together. So here we have... Look at this inhuman beast. And this is the big finger point thing pointing at uh, the Kaiser. There is the inhuman beast. Who are you for? The fiend or America? You're either with us or against us. We are all in this war together or you are traitor. You dissent against any part of the war effort in the government that's committing it, you're a traitor. Every country did this. And then the next part, fear of the enemy. Fear leads to hate. Make them the other, dehumanize them. Them, them, not us. I should add, this propaganda is very effective. Think how effective this is with racism. The entire racism to this. One of the reasons World War II in the Pacific was so horrible is you have the prop wartime propaganda, wartime nationalism, combined with especially the United States, Japan, at that time, pretty darn racist countries. That made the war even more horrible. Well, look at this for hate. Here's Germany. This is a British one, but Americans. Right? Little devils, right? So they're them, others. And it says, monthly report. 
murder babies, children, women, non combatants a good month's business. F numbers. Where did they get these numbers from? Okay. But look at their animals. They're uncivilized beasts coming to kill our children. That means we have no choice but to do what? Kill them. Now, obviously, we have choices, but it's trying to imply we have no choice. Propaganda is really effective. And one more thing, too. You got to take the sacrifice. So much. Every war has inflation. Hey, if we're only producing goods for war. It's not all clothes. It's a food more expensive. Combined with family members going off to war, the fear of that, they're maimed or killed, or they're attacking us. It's a horrible sacrifice. But if we don't win and take this sacrifice, those beasts will get us. So here's a couple of great propaganda posters. I love this one. Here's American. Remember that little cartoon I uh, had in the uh, the killing fields of the gorilla? It's a pretty common one. The beast. Do you remember the term for German civilization? Isn't that clever? I I don't need to tell you what they're implying just happened or is going to happen, right? Enlist in the U.S. Army. But this is what makes it so great. We have to stop this beast because, first off, what's this? It's water. What water is this referring to? You know? Canyon Ferry Lake. Reservoir. That's Europe. That's the Atlantic. Hard to read, but it says America. If we don't stop them there, it's coming here. That's a very good piece of propaganda. I don't mean good as noble or just. I mean good as effective. We obviously know that Germans are not giant gorillas. All we want is that feeling. Here's another good one. Same deal? Question mark. What happens if they win? Blood on their hands as war, a.k.a. bloodshed spreads. But what place is that propaganda for? You know? Look at that. Look at the poster. What place is it for? Everybody want to make a guess? What'd you say? Yeah. Because if this was like Russia, they wouldn't have the globe turn to see Australia. World War. Yeah. So they have the globe turn to see Australia. I like that one. And German U-boats they have is a bloody knife hand killing civilians. Help crush the menace of the seas. And yeah, there's an element of truth of that. But obviously, yeah, it's very well done. And not you can't see anything else or the monster beneath. And then tell out to the Marines saying the civilians should join him. He's taken off his boat to join. And it says right here, Huns kill women and children. That's happening, but it's yeah, very effective propaganda. So the thing about it is, oh, here's German and you, as in all of us, are you going to let him suffer or defend the family in this war? And remember that fake German, uh, Germanic Aryan stuff from before the war I told you about? Defend that classical German family, family defend them. It is your duty or we're all going to be destroyed, Germany. And that's one you'll find World War II posters will be a lot like this. So here's the thing. February, there was a revolution in Russia. And this is an important question for every other ally and Russia itself. They stayed in the war. They had two revolutions. They stayed in the war first. Was this a German victory? And if Germany could knock out Russia, could they do it to France, Britain, or a month and a half after this revolution, the United States? Did Germany win? And that is a real question in total war. If it's not going to be a clear enemy, and when the government finally decides to end the war or the government collapses like happened in Russia, here's the important question. How do you know if you're winning? How do you know if you're losing? What does it look like? And this is really complex. 
Because let's say the United States. The United States was a partial democratic republic. I gotta be clear, I gotta say partial, because most women could not vote. Most African Americans could not vote. American Indians, most American Indians could not vote. So this is not a full democracy, but still, we're somewhat of a democracy. In a democracy, free speech is required. Can you have that? That's why I asked that question before. And this is a question that goes on to this very day. Can you have free speech in a or can you have free speech in a war? Can you have democracy in a war? There's nothing like a democracy if you don't have free speech. I mean, not total free speech, but you know, relative free speech. For example, it was a political decision for the United States to start drafting young men. Four million we drafted and forced into the war. You might break right off. What if you protest that political decision like this right here in Columbus, Ohio? That's dissent against the government. Is that free speech? That's not true. One more question. Would treason look any different than that free speech? You see the problem here? It's really hard. And you allow dissent. Is the set trolling? Is sent treason? If you have political cartoons like this from France, it's Germany winning. Here's a badly mutilated French soldier coming to a wealthy French businessman who's getting rich off the war. And it's hard to see here, but he's like, go get, go back and fight and die because he's getting rich. So this is an anti war cartoon. We can agree or disagree with the sentiment of it, but that's not the point. The point is, is that treason? And if you're in charge, doesn't that look like treason? I'm supposed to win this war and people are complaining it's the draft? Countries in total war will demand social union. Because if you're not unified, it looks like the enemy is winning. So to prove you're winning, we must have total conformity, all together, social unity, all together, nationalism, fight for the war. They do rallies and speeches, all fighting for the war. And what if you oppose the war? What if you say things like this? Well, the United States would react to this with the Espionage Act. What if the countries pass laws like the Espionage Act? Every one. And so add that. Every other country in this war banned free speech. Britain, it was the Defense of the Realm Act. They banned free speech and penis. I find that. Workers will working really long shifts. So they can go to the local pub and have a few beers. And the thought was they were becoming bad workers. So the way to get people to quit drinking so much is that they don't have a salty penis, they won't be thirsty. I just find that one of the most funny things. And so, and so it wasn't until like the 1990s that it was, a, it was legal to have penis in a public establishment in Britain. That just makes me laugh so much. They hadn't even forgot about it. No one enforced it. Like, oh, it's so illegal to have peanuts. All right. But back to this. Every law, every country does this. So go to war, worried about dissent, ban free speech. Every single one, every country. In some way, we'll do this, depending on the ferocity of the total war. We'll try to ban and stop free speech. During the Vietnam War, the United States infiltrated and spied on anti-war groups, tried to get them to commit acts so they could have them arrested. It was called COINTEL, pro counterintelligence program. So it's happened many times before. Same thing happened during the Iraq War. So that's me not talking. So the, this every country is susceptible to this. So I know a lot of you are thinking, yeah, that's fine, but I want to become a dictator of a totalitarian state. I know a lot of you are thinking that right now, right? So that means total political economic. Social control by the government, totalitarians. No coincidence that that term would come about after World War I. What's the first thing you should do if you want to become a totalitarian dictator? Okay. 
or um, or do strut around and, and do swimming and various fitness activities like new salini or food. Besides that, that's true. A lot of manly stuff. What's the first thing you want to do? You take over. What if you want to become a totalitarian state? But yet, to get rid of opposition, it's going to be hard to do. But yet, but getting rid of free speech is really hard. People can find Total war. You find something like total war, and then you say there's enemies are all around us. You go to total war, you ban free speech, and then you say, oh, anybody dissenting against government, they're not dissenting against, dissenting against me, they're traitors. Then you ban free speech. In fact, those who resist, maybe you find places to put them. Camps, perhaps? The Soviet Union, they call them gulags? Or maybe just intern people you don't like? Which happened in the United States in World War II. Concentration camps. That's where you put political prisoners. And therefore, you can pass a law like this and justify it by war. Remember, I told you why Russia, Russia basically lost. They did not get the goals they wanted. They got some of them, but not all. Why are they staying in the war? What if they banned in Russia? Good speech, economic controls, even more control, which is addictive to these people. Oh, it will end. I don't know how. So let's jump to the last couple of things. First off, we get a lot of xenophobia then. Fear of others. The xenophobia is fear of outsiders. Nativism, or a lot of the talk of others. Others who aren't like us. Remember, we're enforcing social unity, so if they're not like us, they must be the enemy. And that is why after every war, there's going to be a rise in nativism and also like there's going to be two anti-communist red scares after World War I and World War II. So like anti, like during the Civil War, it was fear of Irish and German immigrants. Fear of Eastern Europeans because of the communist revolution after World War I. Fear of Japanese immigrants, World War II. Or, for example, after the United States invaded Iraq, which blew things up, which led to civil war in Syria, there are Syrian refugees in just 2008, 2009. The point is, this happens after almost every war. We see it time after time after time. Now, you can say some of the fear is justified or not justified. But the point is, once you enter total war and start going to that, you can't shut off hate. And so, after this, with total war, the rules of civilization are going to be thrown out. And what will now be justified? Because we have no choice. We must win the war. A classic example is gas. Now, it's not in the video. Which country used poison gas first? And Germany had the most advanced chemical industry in the world. Germany also developed a way to get nitrogen from the air, which would revolutionize the production of fertilizer and one more thing. Do we know what you get nitrogen? What do you use nitrogen for? High explosives. You can get them in the air. You don't have to get them in the water. Germany got most of their nitrogen fertilizer, shells and fertilizer from guano. You know what guano is? Bird food. There were mountains of bird, bird guano in Peru and Chile. Peru and Chile went to war. It's mountains. I'm not kidding about this. But they cut the, the blockade, cut that off. They figured out a way to get it in Back to this. That's how they got gas, too. At first, they just had big barrels of gas, and they just would open it up and hope the barrel, you know, the gas would kind of come out, this kind of chlorine, yellowish gas, and hope the wind was blowing. You see, those are all barrels. Pretty ineffective. You had to advance into it if the wind shifted. It was not a very effective weapon on the battlefield, but it did cost tape. And they kept trying and using it, and they kept coming with better and more effective gases. They tried against the Russians first. It caused mass panic, but it didn't lead to a breakthrough. They tried it against Canadians in Belgium. Remember, this is a world war. The Canadians panicked, but the Germans didn't have enough men to exploit it. And the Allies knew this was coming. They were preparing too. They would use gas soon after. They didn't have gas masks, but they knew that masks protected against the spread of germs and disease. But a mask alone wasn't enough to keep. Think about uh, chlorine gas, like a very strong tear gas. That was the first gas. Anybody know what they did? So the gas kind of worked again, or the mask kind of worked against that first gas. Hmm? They took these masks, 
the urinating part. Let me draw it, put it on and on. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I agree, that's pretty gross. But remember, it's your. They don't have one designated guy who's doing all the maths. Here, drink four gallons of water, get to work. We got a regiment. But that's pretty gross. They would have gas masks, pretty primitive ones, but as the war went on. The gas mask then made it so that the gas would not be decisive. But it was terrifying and gas masks on oh, forms. You never put on a gas mask. They're really pleasant, aren't they? You're not telling me. Can't breathe, they're hot, they're heavy. Everyone bring your gas mask tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Goodbye. And now I'll just see And one of the great complexities of all the problems. That's very And now we and and not back then they would have been that situation before, but yeah, so doubt. Science jury uh, just remind me, so I gave you that reading. I'll also on also the rest of the chapter. And I'll be finishing the more up there soon tomorrow. And, uh, so you have a public order. I know you Excuse me, I need questions. Ask me. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 I'm probably I'm going to give you the documents on Tuesday, but you're going to have to do. But you have to actually make it out like. Okay. I know you have it all worked out. Your head, but I just want to go through. Sound good? Thank you. I totally forgot us on. Okay, so. Figure out what we see what you can make. We got to get it. Oh, I know you'll get this soon. If we have to wait a day, then maybe give the notes on the screen. Well, well, um, I'll give you the homework then. Where you are. Perfect. Thanks to us. Uh, we are only going to be here on Wednesday. I just want to stay mass of the world next week. And you still want to go. No, we gotta wait. We gotta get out of turn. We probably yes, but uh, I I have signed up for all pension games. Yeah, we may. Yes, we're good. So uh, we're probably at this best next week. Uh, so if you gotta make you, you gotta make up the song. I know you. Do. But we have to do it the Monday after the video games. I know we got to turn. I did just super fan. It's live. What do you play? Uh, trumpet. However, I talked about this before. I played the trumpet too. Talked about how uh, how it's been stuck. In, huh? Yeah, it's blown up and not like it's like up and how it's gone stuck. But it was super cold. Oh yeah. All day. Yeah. That was um. So I played for you know, so I was, but the freshman year I, I um it was or eighth grade. I went with a band too, but I've got a bunch of actually confused. And it was, yeah, it's about 10 degrees, and a chill. And then second half of the bus. Misery. <laughs> yes.
I, I did look over the video. It shows me killing the person three times. <laughs> no, no. So, sorry. It's, it, no, it's literally like you get to the hit, like where it's like execution pro, and then it's me again. It's I got uh I got a little so the point Oh great the ball here. Did you see that? Yeah. I saw this view on it. I didn't see I didn't look at the video, I just saw the title it's ridiculous. Yes. It's a big place. Um, please tell me Montana. <laughs> it's, 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 it